Good afternoon. I'm Jason Marzak, Senior Director of the Asian Arts Latin America Center at the Atlantic Council. And I'm delighted to welcome all of us both joining here in studio as well as those watching virtually to this incredibly timely and I think also a really important conversation on the role of the private sector in unlocking economic opportunities, economic development opportunities in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, IDB President Elon Goldfund, it's absolutely wonderful to have you here at the Atlantic Council Studios. Uh, Elon will also be joined later by some folks joining us uh, virtually, Brazilian Secretary Renata Amaral, uh, IDB's Matias Bendereski is also here in studio. Uh, Google's Eleonora Rabinovich will be joining virtually, as well as BMP Paribas's Florence uh, Porsche will be joining as speakers for a second panel. Today's quite timely conversation also marks the launch of our center's newest report titled Unlocking Economic Development in Latin America and the Caribbean, Five Opportunities for Private Sector Leadership and Partnership. And speaking of thanking, I'd like to thank the IDB for your collaboration in making this incredibly timely report happen. This report and the launch of it is the latest example of, frankly, how much we here at the Atlantic Council value the longstanding partnership uh, with the Inter-American Development Bank, which has generated, I think, many impactful results uh, over the years. Now, today, why are we focusing June 26 on the role of the private sector and regional development? I think for one, shedding new light on specific opportunities for enhancing business opportunities and shedding development and opportunities for development across the region writ large is at the forefront, especially following the summit for a new global financing pact that was held in Paris last week in which I will speak with Elon about in a moment. Here, Latin America and the Caribbean stands at a pivotal moment. Hard hit by the pandemic in 2020, the region managed an impressive impressive rebound. New uncertainties, however, began to emerge. They emerged following the, um, uh, continue, following, the, the, following the pandemic, and we saw growth further weaken in 2023. We've seen inflationary pressures. We've seen rate hikes in both Latin America and the Caribbean and advanced economies that have impacted the region. Also spillovers of the war in Ukraine, uh, tightening fiscal positions and still high debt levels that dampened the macroeconomic outlook. But these challenges uh, are also coupled with opportunities. There are opportunities for enhancing for an enhanced role of the region in global food security issues and uh, in, in, in supplying world energy resources, biodiversity, among others. In this context, the Adrian Arch Latin America Center partnered with the IDB to highlight the critical role of the private sector in regional recovery and regional development. By working with the IDB's robust network of private sector partners through surveys and interviews, we jointly identified five opportunities to boost high quality growth in Latin America and the Caribbean through private sector leadership and partnership. And the report that we're releasing today also includes not just that analysis, but includes important surveys, which among other things find that uh, when business executives see the three greatest opportunities for social impact, you'll see when you read the report, those business executives over seven in 10 see an opportunity to help to drive economic growth and job creation. When asked again about their opportunities for social impact, uh, almost half see poverty reduction and tackling inequality as an opportunity for social impact. And four in 10 see environmental and climate improvements as part of that social impact. And so we're gonna explore some of the, some important questions today as part of our conversation. We'll look at how can the region transform its digital potential into development, as well as governance, transparency, and equity gains. Can Latin America become a leader in advancing green and climate agenda worldwide? And also, what role can the private sector play in bringing the region's economies closer together through trade, regulatory, and other integration? And of course, sitting here next to the IDB president, how can inst institutions like the IDB partner with the private sector in these efforts? So I'm delighted to honor, honor here uh, and introduce uh, IDB president Elon Goldfein, who joins us here in the Atlantic Council studios. Elon Goldfein was elected president of the IDB in November of last year. Prior to this role, he served as I director of the Western Hemisphere Department at the International Monetary Fund, where he helped countries implement IMF-supported programs to address a number of challenges across the region. He has an over 30-year career uh, working in academia, private sector, multilateral sectors, with profound 
uh, insight and knowledge on regional economics, financial services, climate change, among a, a variety of other issues. Um, he served actually also as senior positions in Brazil, including as the governor of Brazil's central bank. And I'll also mention that while in that role, I, uh, we had the honor of hosting Elon Goldfund here at the Atlantic Council in the room next door to this room uh, back in <laughs> 2017. So time flies when you're having fun. Uh, Elon, your tenure at the IDB comes at a real important moment for the region, a, a moment of profound uncertainty, but also a moment of incredible opportunities, as we were just laying out. This makes the role of the IDB an incredibly important institution, more important than ever. You have already seized on this pivotal moment in just your first few months uh, through your leadership of the IDB. I'll say I was honored to be at your inaugural address yeah. uh, in January, where you quite eloquently laid out your vision for the bank and the region, the priorities for advancing both of those. I was also honored to uh, uh, for the Atlantic Council for to host you for a private discussion here in February, and also to see the incredibly uh, 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 tremendously impactful uh, annual meetings that you hosted in March, just a few months after taking over as IDB president, where we were excited to partner with the IDB on a on a side event. So I hope that working with the, working together with you and the IDB, we can continue to advance policies that fight poverty, inequality, reignite economic growth, and respond to climate change challenges. Let me start off, uh, Elon, by asking about your recent travels. And there have been a lot of recent travels. Yeah. Uh, last week, you were in Paris representing the IDB at the Summit for a New Global Financing Pact uh, that was hosted by President Macron and also featured leaders such as Barbados's Prime Minister Mia Motley. Could you highlight a couple of your takeaways from that important trip and that summit in Paris? Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I, I would like to just acknowledge the cooperation and all the work that we have done together, uh, the Atlantic Council, the center with, uh, with the IDB, and again with the report. So very happy, very thank happy you. to be here. Um, yes. Uh, We've been uh, for a few trips. Uh, last week, we just uh, finished on Friday and came back weekend from uh, the Macron Summit, if you want. It's actually called the New Global Financial Pact. And um, there were quite a bit of leaders, a lot of uh, push. And, but I think the main goal is to find uh, a new way for us to try to finance uh, the large needs uh, of the planet, if you want, mm -hmm. of the global public good, the global challenges. And my two takeaways, if you want, is that if you do want to be able uh, to have uh, uh, an impact, uh, and to have and to mobilize the private sector, uh, you have to care about two different sets. One is scale. Mm -hmm. We need to change the scale of what we're doing. And everybody realized that the public sector by itself can help a lot, can induce, can change the risk profile, but at the end of the day, we need the private sector. In order to do that, some things you need to have. First, you cannot work separately, silos. We need to collaborate. We need to work with other regional banks. We need to work with the other multilaterals, World Bank, IMF. We need to work with civil society. We need to work together because this is a global challenge, really global, universal. Everybody has to chip in. So that's number one. Number two. We need to find ways, practical, pragmatic ways, to attract and mobilize private capital. And that's easy to say, mm -hmm. but you need to figure out a way to change the profile of the risk, which I call re-risk, uh, so that you get more resources. So for example, innovative financial instruments. Can we do more debt swaps? That for climate. Can we do more financing that's based on results, indicators, that lower the cost if you reach these indicators that we want to incentivize? Can we f 
figure out a way of having bonds that have clauses that help countries when they are faced with climate uh, events. So scale, you need cooperation, you need to use the instruments, and at the end, you also need to have impact. And to have impact, we need to focus, to choose the sectors, to choose where you're going, but you also need to be very careful about what is the effectiveness of what you're deploying. So scale and impact, and we need to work on both. And scale and impact, as you said, both require enhanced collaboration. Yes. There's opportunities for that collaboration, which we've already already seen you, not just through your words, Elon, but through your actions, moving forward on those yeah. items in the first few months. Uh, remember back in your speech in, in January, uh, where you specifically highlighted impact mm -hmm. and how you as IDB yeah. president will be measuring, uh, looking at the, the, the importance of the institution through the impact that the institution creates. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's uh, incredibly important. Now, looking at um, a key mission of, of, of the uh, Agent Arch Latin America Center and the work that we do here at the Atlantic Council is highlighting the region's relevance, importance in a larger global context. Uh, I'll say that um, as part of that, we're always trying to show why, why the region matters for the, for the world, right? Uh, and how some of these innovative things that are coming out of the region could be, as your, in your words, you know, scaled at, at a broader level. I imagine as, as, a, as a, quote, ambassador of the region, you're also speaking frequently about the importance of the region at a time of, of great challenges in the global order, how Latin America can be an even stronger partner for the, for the world community. In what ways do you see the region taking on larger global leadership roles at, at this moment of profound uh, uncertainty in the, in the world community? I think the region on what I felt uh, just in my trip now uh, to Europe, and we had, we were before also, is that we are in a crossroad where Latin America can have a very relevant role. Uh, in my inauguration speech that you were there, uh, I talk about the regions, uh, instead of just asking for help and resources, try to figure out what is the role as part of the solutions to the global challenges. And what I feel is that given the challenge exists, Latin America is extremely well positioned to offer the solutions. And I can give you three examples. That sounds great. One, climate, energy, the region is clearly has the comparative advantage, the initial conditions to offer clean energy. We already have like 30 or 40% of the energy in the region which is renewable, clean energy. We do have the minerals that the world needs for electromobility. So nickel, uh, lithium and copper are clearly come from the region. So this is where you can actually think about it can think about green hydrogen also coming from the region. That's exactly yeah. what it looks like the countries are uh, globally need. Uh, in addition, the food, food security. This is the place in the world where you have the ability to produce food. To f Nowadays, for example, you feed 1.2 billion, much more than the population. But you, with the right incentives, with the right way to bring the private sector, you can feed 10 billion people. So that is a game changer. Mm -hmm. And finally, this is the region where you have, can have quite a bit of advances in biodiversity. The Amazon, we are working now in a regional program there. So look at it, you have clean energy, food security, Amazon and biodiversity huge places where the region can be a complementary to the rest and offer solutions. And that I really think yeah. that this is getting there. Very fun. And probably one reason that uh, we were speaking before in your travels, you've seen even more interest from outside of the region oh, yeah. and, and the role of the region in so far as being a partner at a global stage. Definitely. So uh, when we go to a, to a country, they ask as well, uh, 
we are now thinking about uh, Latin America as an important contributor for that. And some other places that I did not mention, for example, in the fintech and payment system mm -hmm. and the Brazil Speaks, this whole area of innovation that also comes, which are not the global uh, challenges, but also contributing from, from the region. One of the many reasons we brand this series is we're using the hashtag proactive lack, look at looking to the future <laughs> and, the, and the importance well, of the region. That's a good, important point because we need to be proactive. I mean, we have to stop the view that we have the comparative advantage, that we have the natural resources in the region. You need to find the right incentives, mm -hmm. the right rule of law, the right institutions. You need to make it happen. Yeah. So we, we have the good complementarities in food, climate, in biodiversity, but we need to make it work. Elon, one thing you mentioned previously is the importance of partnerships. In yes. the first question, you laid out uh, uh, scale, attracting them, and investment, and partnerships being fundamental. Uh, so I have two partnership-related questions that come to mind based on, on that comment. The first about the private sector, which is the main focus of the report yeah. that we are launching today. From your pers what perspective, what sets the IDB apart? Uh, and actually, what additional actions are you thinking about taking that could further set the IDB apart in its ability to mobilize private sector partnerships to really drive that key socioeconomic progress that we also desire across the region writ large, especially around the, the priorities that you've laid out um, both today, but also previously, you've laid out priorities of social issues, priorities of infrastructure, priority to climate. So where are, where are those opportunities for private sector partnership with the IDB? It is very clear to me, I'm now six months into the job, um, that the IDP is, uh, is an, an important conduit for not only government and the public sector, but also the private sector to come together with the IDP. And, and when, you, when you look at it, I, I ask, uh, what are the strengths? Mm -hmm. Because if you know the strength and you know the weaknesses, this is where you can work. Yeah. So start with the strengths. It is hard to find an institution that have both very large presence regional. We basically have all the countries in the region, the regional. We have presence there. So it's not just like one representative and so it's really offices with people looking at projects, talking to the government, talking to the ministries. They know the country and it's recognized. But we also have the other side, which are the rest of the world. We have 26 regional members with 22 non-regional. And they all are part of the board, and they all think about it and say, how can we be the, how can we, we, we bridge so the members that are non-regional non are thinking how they can help, how can they contribute. The members that are regional saying, well, this is what we can do. So both sides are IDB. Yeah. Finally it is important to realize that we have a relevant public sector arm, but also an important private sector. IDB Invest, which is in the process of growth and capitalization, but also IDB Lab, which is our innovation and venture capital arm uniquely. Yeah. Nobody else has a lab like that. So strong presence, quite a bit of members that are not from the region, mm -hmm. and private, public, both sides. Yeah, and as you mentioned, the ID, IDB lab in particular, what, it, what it, it's tremendously important for advancing the, the mission writ large of the IDB. Uh, I'm um, actually this very event event space. Uh, Janet Yellen uh, highlighted uh, some time ago, uh, last, last year actually, a speech, uh, the importance of the, um, the, of the multilateral system and the importance yeah. of the multilateral system, the unique role and potential for the multilateral system in rising up to today's global uh, and regional challenges that uh, don't see, those challenges don't oftentimes see national borders. Those challenges <laughs> transcend national yeah, borders. Course. 
And one way to think about is, is how the multi multi institutions can work differently is even more effective collaboration. And I know that um, myself and many people were so pleased to see that uh, World Bank President Ajay Bang on his first uh, trip as World Bank President, that he went to Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, and as well that you accompanied him uh, on that trip to the to the region uh, where you, you you were together in, in, in Peru, you were together in Jamaica. Um, uh, that's what a great signal uh, for the multi, for the for the world community of you, IDB president, and and Ajay Banga as World Bank president, traveling together to the to the region. And uh, so, I'd like to ask you how you envision the IDB's partnership with the World Bank, and frankly, other multilateral institutions. How you see those that partnership uh, evolving, and what new opportunities do you see, especially uh, uh, a couple of weeks after that trip uh, with Ajay to the region? Yeah, I mean, that's, I think, changes and uh, 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 the direction has to be set by, uh, by the top uh, leaders of the institution. And as you mentioned, this is where you send the signal, you send the symbol of traveling together. That was the first trip of AG. It was for, the, for Latin America, and we went together. I mean, you mentioned that you, I was having a lot of trips. One part of it is because I exactly had to include this week with the World Bank, but I said, this is gonna be the first trip of the World Bank. We need to do it together. We have known AJ for a long time. Uh, you mentioned 30 years of career of mine. I've been uh, other lives, the private sector where we, we had contact. And then when I was the central bank, I was the regulator of the credit card company. So we have a long time and we basically said, well, let's go together. Let's Let's send the signal that that's it. That's that's important for us, uh, and we basically now are sitting beyond the symbol, beyond the meetings that we had, beyond the travel that we did, and saying, well, where we can cooperate, uh, we are uh, we are working on an, on the memorandum of understanding where I like the number three, mm -hmm. three priorities that we can do together. What are the priorities? So we are working on that. We will probably announce uh, relatively soon. Uh, but not only the World Bank, because there's an IMF. And you say, why the IMF? Well, the IMF is working with the RST to have the RSF programs. They have pilot programs. Three out of the few programs are from the region, Barbados, Jamaica, Costa Rica. That's a huge part of it. And those are projects linked to climate, which is the complementarities. So the IMF thinks about macrocritical and going forward, and we basically have the project, have the views on how we can address climate challenges. So this is a clear complementarity. We, we issue a, a press release just last week during the Macron mm -hmm. summit, where we basically say we're going to work together with the projects, IDB is working. We're going to work on the complementarities. We're going to work with the financial instruments, including a green bond facility. We're going to work together. So we are not only talking. Yeah. We are walking the talk. Yeah, that's inc incredibly important. I know we're out of time, but just uh, one, one last quick question. Since you're uh, a few months now into the job, is there a, a particular um, surprise for you in these first, first few months uh, on the job or maybe a le major learning moment that you'd like to uh, share? I don't know. I mean, it's been, the other day I was with, uh, with the AJ, and, he, and I was like, oh, I just started six months ago. And he said, I just started nine days ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, I'm a veteran already. Yeah, I, yeah. I have to show results. Right, right. So I was thinking, well, but I mean, you get into the job. I, there are a lot of nice things. The talent that I found the nice uh, initiatives people bring, the great potential, the human capital there, uh, people motivated, and uh, I see everybody also looking at what we are doing, with it. it's a lot of work because we are in a very special moment. The new presidency is mm -hmm. all around, yeah. but also a new moment in terms of where the MDBs are. They are being uh, called to do more, and they are called to do more because we are in a very special moment regionally and globally. People are coming with numbers like two and a half trillion dollars we need. 
where are we going to get this result? The private sector, but MDB is healthy. Yeah. So here is where I start. I look at the talent, but I look at the challenge and say, oh my God, we, we will need to work 24 seven, maybe more than that. How can you do more? <laughs> That's the issue. We need to focus, prioritize. So I, I like it. And of course, a nice part of the job, this is the IDP I feel at home. This is the region. Yeah. So you go, the other day we're talking about, you go to the elevator, people talk to you, nobody looks down. Everybody <laughs> says, <laughs> when you say hi, people give you kisses, they give you handshakes. Yeah. So we are back in the region yeah. in Washington, D.C. Yeah, a, a slice of Latin America and the Caribbean on, on New York Avenue exactly, here in Washington, exactly. D.C. Yeah. As well exactly. as here on 15th and 15th and L as well. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I, and I want to also reiterate, Elon, uh, the partnership that we've seen uh, for many, many years. This center is turning 10 years in October, and over the last 10 years, uh, we've worked tremendously close with the uh, with the IDB. And, and I see firsthand all the time, as you're saying, the incredible talent uh, across the the, the, the bank. Uh, any opportunity we have to have uh, IDB experts participate in our conversations, we thank you. We, we certainly do so. So thank you uh, for the incredible uh, partnership and uh, for taking the time to be here, but uh, uh, sliced in the middle of what will probably be continued trips that you'll have uh, over the course of the next next few months. So congratulations on the first few months and, and, uh, and so excited again to be putting out this report together with the IDB today. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Thank you. And well, it's a great collaboration. Thank you very much. We'll take a, a quick uh, uh, break for the next uh, moment and then we'll be joined by the, uh, the second panel moderated by my colleague Pepe Zank. Thank you again, Elon. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Atlantic Council once again. Uh, we're starting here with the second panel, hoping to, hard, it's, a, it's a very tough suit to follow, but we're trying to pick up some of the conversation we had earlier uh, with President Elon Gofran from the IDB, and we're hoping to really get into a wide range of topics today uh, with a stellar group of speakers representing the private, the public, and multilateral sectors. And of all the topics we're hoping to cover in the second half, we're trying to emphasize just once again the importance of multi-sectoral collaboration among these different sectors. Uh, very quickly introducing uh, the panelists that we have with us today. Joining me in the studio, Matias Benderski, who is the manager of the Office of Outreach and Partnerships at the IDB, and his office is in charge of liaising uh, with many constituencies of the development, uh, development community for the IDB, including the private sector. Matias, so great to have you. And I should add very quickly that President Gofan mentioned earlier the uh, SLB linked bonds. In your previous role at the IDB as the representative in Uruguay, you were actually very much leading that effort. So congratulations on that piece. Um, and then remotely, we have three speakers with us, uh, extraordinary speakers, starting with, uh, I would say, uh, Eleonora Rabinovich, who is, who is a public policy and senior government affair policy manager for Google and acting head for Spanish-speaking Latin America, calling from Buenos Aires, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Eleonora, it's, it's always great to win our paths cross. I'd love to hear your insights specifically on some of the digital-related issues. Thank you. And then we have Florence Boucher, who is the, uh, the head of uh, CIB, Corporate and Institutional Banking, and head of CSR in the Americas for BNP uh, Paribas. And I would say that you, know, you are an act active collaborator with the multilateral organizations, and you work a lot on sustainable finance and, of course, you know, social and economic inclusion. So looking forward to getting into that, uh, of course. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Secretary Henata uh, Amaral, 
certainly, you know, deserves a very well warm come and I would say a metaphorical uh, red carpet, uh, a special guest and, and friend of the center. Thank you so much, Hanada, for joining us. Dr. Anamara is an expert in international development, international trade, uh, and uh, she is the Secretary for International Affairs and Development at the Planning and Budget Ministry in Brazil. So looking forward to that, uh, the, to, to the government perspective from her side as well. Now. I think we'll kick off with a question to, to, to Secretary Amaral, and surprisingly, Amazon, right? The previous panel spoke a little bit about the opportunities, the unique global opportunities and challenges that you know, our region faces. And I think it's impossible to talk about that without mentioning the Amazon. So the specific question for you, Secretary Amaral, is you know, we know that sustainable development in the Amazon is a priority for this government in, in, in Brasilia. But what are some of the key expectations or strategies that Brasilia has in this, in, this, uh, in this moment, and specifically from the perspective of your ministry. And if I can add a second question, if it's not too much, uh, how do you see the private sector contributing to some of these efforts? Excellent. Thank you, Pepe. And uh, let me just uh, start by saying that I feel home at the Atlantic Council, so thank you so much for inviting me to join this panel. And I want my red carpet when I'm there in DC next time. Uh, let me just start uh, by highlighting something that President Elon just mentioned in the previous uh, conversation. We need to work together, and this is a global challenge. We cannot work in silos, and that, by that I mean that we need the public and the private sector working together. As most of you know, the Amazon rainforest is huge. It's larger than the contiguous United States without Alaska and Hawaii. Only in Brazil, we have uh, around 28 million people living in the Amazon region, uh, which comprises nine states of Brazil. During the previous administration, policies to promote sustainable development in the Amazon region, was they were largely neglected, as you are well aware. The first actions uh, that this administration took were directed to reinforce authorities that have the role to halt the deforestation, such as the Brazilian Institute for, uh, of, of Environment and Renewable Resources, IBAMA. But it's obvious that only fighting deforestation is not enough when you need to guarantee all those people, 20, around 28 million people who live in the Amazon region, conditions for development. And by that, I mean war conditions, education, etc. In early August, Brazil will be hosting for the first time a summit with the presidents of all the eight South American countries covered by the Amazon rainforest. This conference will be held in Belém, the same city that it will host COP 30th in 2025. The idea of having this summit comes from the view that we need to develop public policies which are aligned with our neighboring countries, and we need all the relevant stakeholders to take part in the conversation, including, of course, the private sector. During the Amazon summit in August, uh, the government will be promoting the Amazon dialogues uh, alongside with uh, social movements and the private sector, which is an opportunity for companies which want to engage and understand the opportunities and challenges in the Amazon region. We are also aware of initiatives such as the Partner for the Amazon Platform, Plataforma Parceiros pela Amazonia in Portuguese, that is held by the private sector with the support of USAID. The initiative supports sustainable entrepreneurship in the region. Among uh, the mission of, of, the, of the partnership is accelerating small and sustainable business in the Amazon region and partner with private sector companies to develop and identify innovative sol solutions for sustainable development and biodiversity conservation in the Amazon. So besides engaging in government for like the Amazon summit, Connecting with, connecting with the private sector-led activities, and we have a bunch of them currently running in Brazil and in the region, with a focus of sustainable development are always, we understand that, that larger companies could explore, are ways that larger com companies could explore um, in order to contribute for, uh, to the efforts that are being made to develop good public policies in the region. It, it just, just to finalize, uh, it is also from meetings with the private sector that the governments, and I say that uh, talking about myself, but I know my colleagues as well, 
is, is from those conversations with the private sector that we, at the subnational level, at the federal level, get a relevant information for designing relevant public policies for the region. So again, as Elon also stressed in the beginning, we need to act together. It's a global challenge and we need the public and the private sector acting together. Thank you, Pepe. Thank you for that, Secretary Amaral. And, and I'll say that when you're mentioning these specific partnership examples, Matias was sitting right next to me in the office, was, was taking notes on some of the specific partnership ideas. So I think it's only natural I, I turn it over to you, Matias. And we know specifically when it comes to the Amazon, related to the previous question, the IDB's Amazon initiative is one of the flagship initiatives you have. And it's a perfect example of what the Secretary has mentioned, you know, public-private multilateral collaboration. So I'd love for you to, you know, walk through the audience, you know, what are some of the latest development and progress in that initiative? And of course, if you want to take the opportunity to respond to anything that the Secretary has mentioned or the President has mentioned, please go ahead as well. Thank you, Pepe, and, 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 and uh, hello to all my fellow panelists. Um, yes, there is, a, there is a couple of things that I can tell you that are um, happening these days that uh, I think the audience uh, needs to, to know. First of all, let me put clear um, here that what uh, our President Elon um, said and uh, Secretary Amaral also um, said right now, it's also a priority for, for IDB. Um, you said before, IDB launched an initiative back in 2021 um, called the Amazon Initiative. Uh, when the president took office uh, just recently, six months ago, um, he said we need to, even before that, before taking office, we need to revamp what we have. What we have is great. We're very grateful to the many partners that we have. The initiative already had um, several million dollars. I'm not going to go into the detail of the numbers, but several mil million dollars on a multi um, donor trust fund, uh, in a bioeconomy trust fund, um, in, in, a, in a sustainable development trust fund. Um, we have worked with partners that are members of IDB, um, part of those 22 members that, that President Dillon mentioned before, um, and also the Green Climate Fund. So um, though th that initiative took many different uh, shapes and forms, and the idea was to help IDB deploy better and faster resources to the region, taking care not only about uh, you know, the, the climate and bioeconomics of the, of the, of the region, but also um, you know, uh, you know, uh, consolidate a, an effort that would be um, a little bit larger. And the way we are trying to think of this initiative now, it's we changed the name from the, or we will change the name from the initiative to a regional program. And the regional program um, meaning that it's going to be more than ID, an IDB run initiative. We want to be able to help out, and I think the secretary just mentioned that, and our president, to create a, a, a platform that, that could uh, make easier for everybody. Everybody, as you said before, private sector, I think the secretary just mentioned one of the platforms from the par uh, private sector that it's, it's uh, you know, promoted by U uh, USAID. But there's a lot of different foundations. There's a lot of bilaterals that went into the um, eight countries that, uh, at least the eight countries that the IDB has offices in um, that are in South America that, that um, are part of the Amazon. Um, and, and bring together everybody in, a, in one platform that would eventually identify the financial gaps. You know, we, we might be overdoing some of the regions, but you know, we might be um, you know, uh, du duplicating efforts in some of the regions and not taking care of some others. And so the first thing that we, we, we thought was a big, deep um, mapping of what is exactly happening with donors in the Amazon. Donors that include also the, the national development banks and all these initiatives that are carried away by countries themselves. So the idea is to put a platform together to be the honest broker, I guess, of the platform. Uh, we have our own funds um, that were deployed in the IDB, for which we're you know, very, very um, thankful to Germany, Switzerland, uh, Belgium, Spain, uh, the Netherlands. There's plenty of countries that actually contributed to those, and that's um, going to be put to a good use, but we want to bring others to the platform and not necessarily to work through the IDB, but to work, you know, in collaboration all together. So a few things that I wanted to, to mention, um, and, and we, we can talk more um, later about this, there's going to be a finance minister's uh, meeting in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, you know, on June 30th. 
Secretary Amaral, of course, is, is fully briefed, fully participating on all this, in, in a big part of this. And then, as, as, um, as Secretary Amaral said, there's a couple of events. There is first the minister, um, an Amazon environment uh, minister's meeting in uh, Leticia and also the presidential summit that was mentioned before. So that's a little bit of the timeline. In between that timeline, we would love to put together this regional uh, uh, program with the platform that I mentioned before. Thank you for that. And we like concrete action. So thanks for laying out this timeline. I think, you know, for, for all of those who are sitting in the audience today and virtually connecting, you know, think about these timelines and how we can collaborate around some of these uh, now no longer initiative, but a regional program that we're talking about. Uh, I want to switch gear a little bit and turn it over to Eleonora in this case, asking about a different question and a different topic, which is digital, right? So at the previous panel, we talked about, and President Gofan also mentioned that digital fintech, among other uh, digital technology related issues, is one of the things that really set our region apart, even in the global context. And indeed, digital transformation innovation is one of the five opportunities that we have identified in this report. But back to the point about the global context, I would love for you to explain to this audience here, why is Latin America and the Caribbean such an attractive market in a global context in this space? Thank you, Pepe, and I'm so honored and happy to be sharing this panel with these distinguished speakers. Uh, including Secretary Amaral and Matias from the IDB. We are a proud partners of the IDB and also Florence. So thank you for the invitation. So Google has been present in Latin America for the past uh, 17 years, since 25. And as you said, we believe that LATAM has a huge opportunity to grow through digital transformation. First, uh, LATAM has a vibrant startup ecosystem that is very well known, a unique entrepreneurial and innovative spirit. Uh, for example, when we opened our Google for Startup campus in Brazil in 2016, there were no unicorns in the region. And today, there are 35, including 13 startups that were part of our Google for Startup program. So investing in this ecosystem uh, uh, has a lot of impact in the way that we can develop our digital economy. Also, LATAM has a lot of opportunity uh, for infrastructure development and a growing adoption of e-commerce solutions. I, know, I don't know if you all know that uh, uh, during the past year, Latin America was the region with the highest growth in e-commerce with three leading countries. Brazil is one of them and also Argentina and Mexico, according to the Global E-Commerce uh, Forecast uh, 2021 report. And there's a huge opportunity to continue growing as uh, if we all act together, as you, as President Goldfan and, and uh, Secretary Morales and Matias have just said. In Latin, in Latin America, according to a report that we launched last year, um, uh, and the ADB was uh, with us when we launched that report, realizing the full potential of digital technologies could generate an annual economic impact of up to 1.35 trillion by 2030 in six of the region's largest economy, which is 23% of this country's combined GDP. This is a lot of uh, data, but just to show the potential of our region, if we, the private sector, the public, and the multilateral organizations act together. All these attributes and opportunities were motivating factor for us to announce last year uh, during the Summit of Americas, a five-year, 1.2 billion investment in the region that is gathered in four pillars. Infrastructure, expanding opportunities through digital skills, supporting the growth of the startups and the SMEs, and also building inclusive and sustainable communities, which is uh, aligned with all the discussions and the issues that were mentioned before uh, by, by Matias and also President Goldfan and Secretary Amaral. So we are very happy to be working and contributing to this uh, region. We are very happy to be working with all the government and also with multilateral organizations like the IDB and also with civil society like the Atlantic Council and many other other NGOs that are um, partnering with us in the region to promote digital transformation and digital growth. Thank you, Leonora. I have many questions about the infrastructure skills and adoption piece, so hopefully we can come back to you in a little bit about that. Um, but yeah, excellent. I think the report you're referring to is the Digital Sprinters report. At least that's one of those. It's an excellent resource. I certainly recommend folks to, to check it out when you have a chance. Um, now, turning over to Florence, um, 
I have a question more about on the ESG side of things. I'm asking this because I know that you work very closely on these issues and that in a BNP Paribas, in fact, a award-winning industry leader in this space, I'm not mistaken at this point, two years in a row of the by Latin finance on, on, the, on the Sustainable Finance Bank of the Year. Um, and a question for you, once again, continue along the, 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 the style of this conversation is get down to the nitty gritty and specifics. If I can ask you to just highlight maybe a couple of specific, you know, whether that's innovative or highly impact sustainable uh, deals that your bank has facilitated in recent years, that would be excellent. And if, if helpful, you know, explain that to, to the audience, why they're so relevant, what's the relevance there? And I see you nodding your head earlier when Matias was mentioning the partnership piece and how can we better work with the government. So maybe I can squeeze in a final question there of how do you see the public sector possibly, you know, help catalyze and, 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 and incentivize private sector participation in, in similar deals going forward? Well, thank you very much for having me here, Pepe, and be together with this uh, great panel. Well, first of all, I've heard great words or words that we're very aligned with uh, in the first um, first uh, answers. Uh, I heard impact, I heard scale, and I heard partnership. And th those three words are extremely important for us. So maybe let me start by saying that, yes, we've been a pioneer in the sustainable uh, finance capital market for over a decade. We started internally by putting in place our own policies, pretty strict. We, we made our own commitments. We've made some very strong announcements on fossil fuels. And we've also started to work with our clients to try to push them, incentivize them to uh, be more impactful as well. So we started working on the green and social framework. So green bonds, social bonds uh, over the past decade those are linked to use of proceeds, and, and I'm not sure everyone in, in the audience knows how it works, but those, basically, the proceeds of the bonds go to specific, um, specific investments. So for countries, for instance, it's a budget line, and there's a commitment to invest the proceeds in, in, in renewable or, or in, uh, in social. And then the market moved a bit towards the linked instruments, where Basically, the, we're not talking about use of proceeds. We're talking about commitments to improve either on the environmental space, on the social space. And so that's what we call sustainability linked. So social linked, uh, green bond, green, green, uh, green bond linked. Uh, so we, we've played a key role in all those issuances. We've also landed money. So we've put our balance sheet at stake and that's where you have sustainability linked loans, for instance. And so over the years, we've led numerous impactful transactions and we we're very proud to have helped both the private and, and public sector. So you asked me to give you some specific examples. I'm gonna give very, very different ones. The first one I'll give is uh, the electric bus fleet that we helped finance with IDB Invest for the city of Bogota. Why am I mentioning this one? It's because it's really a partnership between a bank, so BNP Paribas in that case, between NLX, between IDB Invest, between InfraBridge. So a number of partners get, got together and found a way to finance long-term a fleet of electric buses. This is small, but it's meaningful because it's, it's replicable. And I think this is the type of transaction that we can replicate in all cities. And the impact is social and it's quite important. The second one I will mention is the, um, the issuance of Banco do Brasil. It was their first sustainability bond of 750 million, where the proceeds are going to go to uh, social projects with a key, um, key focus on uh, small, mid-sized enterprises and, and women-led enterprises, as well as some renewable projects. So there, the impact is quite significant. 750 million is large. And the last one I will mention is the inaugural sustainability-linked bond for the Republic of Chile with 2 billion, 20 year. It was the first time a sovereign was issuing this type of instrument. And so the first time a sovereign was also committing to achieving KPIs, so um, objectives linked to greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, in the case of Chile, the share of non-conventional renewable energy in the, the national electric grid. So those are innovations. There have been a few following that one. 
But I think it's every, you know, every year there is something new coming up and we're trying to find ways to be at the forefront of all this. And as to your question regarding partnership, I think we've been working very closely with the multilaterals. Uh, we feel that there are transactions where we need the help of those multilaterals because either uh, they're too long or they're, they're, they have some features that are pretty difficult for the private sector to take, risk to take. And, and the partnership is extremely important because it really allows to wrap up those, those big and significant impactful transactions. So we can mention the AB loans that are done uh, together with the IFC or, or with other multilaterals, but it's, it's very important to, to, to join forces if we want to finance some of the more difficult uh, projects in the region. Thank you for that, Florence. And again, appreciate the very specific comments. I think, you know, the, the modality of moving from proceeds budget line support to kind of the SLB uh, related actions. And once again, Matias here, if we had time, I would love to explore that a bit more with you given your experience in Uruguay on that. But I, I would say that it's just so important related to the previous conversation, how we need to understand how the market is evolving and how we can work with uh, different clients and actors in this space to, to make sure that private sector does play a supporting role, an important leadership and supporting role in, in this space. Uh, in the interest of time, so I'm going to put all the speakers on the spot to provide very quick response, maybe a minute, a minute and a half. And of course, we'll start with uh, Secretary Amaral, uh, again, VIP treatment here. So uh, I think two things we've heard earlier. One is that, you know, President Gofans mentioned that there is a lot of momentum globally for modernizing, of course, upgrading the international financial system, development finance, that sort of stuff. And then second, we know that you mentioned earlier that Brazil will be hosting COP in 2025 in Berlin. And next year, we also know that Brazil is going to be hosting the G20. So when we think about the global leadership opportunities that Brasilia is going to have in the next two years, if I can ask you to summarize in one and one half minute, what are specifically some of the key development finance topics that you would like to see be incorporated in these international fora? Uh, and how can organizations like the IDB support you in these efforts? Thank you, Pepe. I'm gonna try to be very uh, quick here. Um, as host of the G20 next year, Brazil will certainly have uh, among its priorities, the reform of international and multilateral organizations that we know already, and we are thinking about the UN, the WTO, the international financial institutions as well, in order to strengthen multilateralism and to increase efforts of uh, to poverty, redu poverty reduction and sustainable development. Here under my, my secretariat, we have a commission responsible for analyzing projects financed by international institutions such as the IDB. So at this very moment, we are running a comprehensive reform in all the processes with the, within the Commission for financial uh, external finance to make it faster, more transparent, and capable to approve projects with larger impact. Uh, the IDB has been key um, alongside with other multilateral organizations or multilateral banks. Uh, in order to build, together with the Brazilian government, the country strategy for the next uh, four years. So we are thinking together with the banks and, and financial institutions, not only about the G20 presidency, but also COP 30th. Uh, and um, a lot, uh, I think what, what is important here is just to, to, to highlight that um, in every work we are doing with all these institutions and talk, focusing on G20 and COP 30th, we are trying to prioritize uh, sustainable development, climate change, poverty reduction, inclusion, and gender equality. Those are the five priorities of, of, of the Minister of Planning and Budget, but also, also uh, they are requests from the presidency of Brazil. So everything we do, the country strategy with the banks and, and uh, development agencies, Everything at our pluriannual plan that we're going to deliver in August and it's being built here by the Minister of Planning, everything has these priorities and we are trying to review every process we do here inside with the financial institutions to be aligned with the Brazilian priorities for the next years, for the years to come and for the events to come also. Thank you for that. that. That's very helpful for us to think about, again, this global regional connection that we see between Latin America and Caribbean and the, and the rest of the world. Now, uh, turning over back to Matias in the studio, 
Uh, in the report that we are launching today, we identify five opportunities. I would have asked you all five about all five of them, but we don't have a whole lot of time here. So let me ask you to perhaps just pick one or two opportunities where you see from your team, the partnership team within the IDB, where the most significant private sector interest has come in in recent years. And if possible, quickly mention some concrete examples of collaboration and partnership along with those opportunities you see as well. Thank you, Pepe. Um, since 2008, the, the office was created in 2008 we have worked with more than 300 uh, private partners. So you can imagine I have a lot of examples uh, to, to tell you. The, the, um, the, the, you know, among the, the five priorities, I think uh, some of them were mentioned by our president, um, you know, enhanced markets, uh, enhancing uh, market size scalability. He talked a little bit about regional integration. We are talking about regional integration in the context of the Amazon, but also the Caribbean and um, there's also other priorities, regional priorities for us um, in the agenda. I would say that uh, when, when uh, you know, when, when uh, President Dillon was mentioning also the, the um, advancing the green agenda, you also have that in the report, and I think that's, that's something key. We're, we're rethinking our IDV invest uh, business plan with the, the model of originate to share, um, and that is to include more of, of, of partners in private sector and less of IDB in, in each uh, transaction, um, bringing them, of course, it, uh, within the umbrella of IDB, IDB Invest in this case. Um, climate, climate financing is a big part of, of, of what the MDB reform that Secretary Amaral was mentioning, the, the, uh, you know, the, all the climate financing to bring private sector in, like the sustainability link bond in Uruguay, in which um, they're committing to two indicators um, and if they achieve those indicators, they get a, a price re, a cut on, on the bond. And if they don't, they pay a penalty. So there is skin in the game from all parts. And we believe that that's a very good example of how um, the private sector will be involved in, in way more of this climate change um, agenda, the green financing. Um, there's there is several things that I could say from you know with with the with the people that are joining us in, in the panel. Um, with Eleonora and Florence uh, uh, more than anything on the private sector because we are very good partners with, with, with Google in several initiatives. One, one of them it's on, on, with IDB Lab. Uh, we're collaborating uh, to host a competition for women entrepreneurs. Um, and this is within the context of a gender and AI challenge that we put together um, you know, to, to help promote women participation without a bias. Um, in the economy, um, and then also with Benepe Paribas, to, to conclude on the minute and a half that you gave us, uh, we do have a very good partnership, not only on the financing side um, that, 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 uh, that Florence was, was mentioning, but also on something that we called, it's, a, it's, a, it's the first uh, corporate sustainability index promoted, um, designed, and powered by an MDB. Um, and we are partners in that, and there is already a structured product that has our index on top of the price of a, of, of a bond in this case. That's excellent. And I think, you know, it's only natural that we now turn to Eleonora and, and, and Florence to, to hear some of their perspective on related issues. And I think, Eleonora, I want to double down on the question I had earlier about the digital aspect of it. Specifically in the report, we talked about what we see as the three digital enablers where the private sector can play a really important leadership role, which is infrastructure, skills, and, uh, and adoption. And you kind of touched on that a little bit as well. So. In the, in the next minute and a half, you can just give us some concrete examples of what Google has been doing along these three pillars, if possible. Uh, I think that would be excellent. Thank you, Pepe. So we have very few time, but as you said, like in our report, Digital Sprinters, we highlight the relevance of public-private collaboration and partnerships to fulfill the opportunities of digital transformation. And we have been investing in these three pillars, in innovative technologies, in digital skills and supporting the ecosystem and also infrastructure. For example, one of the things that we have been doing is deploying subsea cables to promote connectivity and access. We have five subsea cables, submarine subsea cables uh, in the region. Uh, we have recently announced the fifth one, which is Firmina, that will connect Argentina to the United States and will go also uh, through Uruguay and Brazil. Um, also, our Google Cloud regions uh, in Santiago de Chile and also in San Pablo, Brazil, uh, are giving businesses access to computer power, and we have announced the third one in Mexico. 
that it's going to be uh, fully oper uh, operational in the uh, upcoming years. And something that is very relevant for us is to expanding the opportunities through digital skills uh, for all the population. That's why last year we announced that we are going to provide 1 million scholarships for Google certificates so more people can achieve uh, jobs and uh, well-paid jobs uh, through technology. And we are partnering with NGOs and governments to be able to deploy these uh, certificates. This year, we have announced already uh, 120 um, million certificates as part of this uh, uh, bigger bucket. Uh, we also know that gender gap is one of the most relevant uh, obstacles and challenges in our region. That's why we are also partnering with civil society and governments to help uh, bridge uh, and, and, and solve that problem. For example, early this year, we partnered with the Secretary of Economy in Mexico to launch uh, Mujeres del Sureste, uh, which is a program aid at given um, also financial inclusion and also digital skills to women that are located in the southeast region. Um, and we are deploying that program uh, with very good results. And we believe that all together we have to work to give access and to provide and allow all the benefits of innovative technologies. For example, AI, everybody's speaking about AI uh, these days. Uh, in Google, we have been working in AI for uh, some a couple of decades, and we believe that uh, there's an opportunity to develop uh, AI in a way that is both bold and responsible, and for that we need to act all together. And that's why we are very proud partners of the FERLAC initiative that is has been driven by the IDB. We are founding members, and it's a good example of uh, a space where different experts from civil society and academia and the government and the private sector can act together to think how we want to deploy AI for the benefit of our populations in the region. These are just of only one, uh, a couple of examples of, of, of these collaborations and, and initiatives that we are having from Google in the region. Thank you for that. And we indeed actually wrote about the Fairlack initiative as one of the partnership examples in the report. Uh, we're running a little over, so I'll ask um, Florence to, to close us out with a final comment. I have so many questions, but you know, uh, Eleonora mentioned the gender issue, and Matias, you also mentioned the importance of gender-related partnerships, the IDB. So, and we know that DEI in general is a huge priority for you, uh, Florence, and of course for for, BN, for BNP Barrio. So. If you can just, in a, in a final minute, give us some example of how you are advancing this work, uh, whether that's externally through the work you're doing through the partnership and internally within the company, I think that's gonna be super important as we think about the demonstration effects that multinational companies have. So maybe starting internally, uh, we, we're working on our culture. Uh, we feel it's extremely important that everyone feels uh, well integrated. So we have employee resource groups as many of the large companies. And we, we spend a lot of time on those. We feel it's extremely important to, to give them the attention they need and make sure that everyone uh, feels really uh, well in the company. We're also looking very carefully at our hiring. Uh, we want to make sure that we, we hire the right people and we, we hire with the right diverse mix. Very important, not only on gender, but on, on about everything. So. So attention to hiring, attention then to developing our people. So we have a number of programs internally that really are focused on developing um, the minorities and people who uh, come from diverse, diverse backgrounds. So big program at global level that we replicate in, in each and every country where we have a presence. Uh, externally, we've been spending a lot of time and effort on microfinance because we feel it's really a way to help women. Usually those microfinance entities tend to be led uh, by women. And so uh, the, the group has spent, has actually invested or lent over a billion dollars in the past 25 years uh, to support microfinance entities. 
And maybe I can give uh, two examples that are a bit smaller, but maybe a bit more specific and very recent. Uh, we supported together with the IFC in the, in the format of AB loans, two Brazilian commercial banks, so Banco Cooperativo Cicredi and Daicoval, uh, in order for them to support uh, women-led micro uh, enterprises. So we did that in the past year. And uh, one of the deals was actually won the, won the social loan award by environmental finance uh, lately. So I think doing those, we can, um, or this type of transactions, we, we can really uh, help move the topic forward. Once again, appreciate your, your, your very detailed comments. I think one of the value of the conversation like this that we host at the Atlantic Council is that we can combine some of the high level, bigger picture policy issues with the day-to-day -day specific examples how to move the needle forward on some of the critical uh, policy issues in the region. I want to thank all our panelists again, Matias in the in the studio, and of course, Florence de Honora and Secretary Amaral virtually joining us. Apologies that we ran a little over, but we look forward to continue having these conversations about the importance of public, private, multilateral partnership. Starting with today's report launch, please check it out it's on our website and a special thank you to the idb team the entire idb team has been so great to work with you throughout this process thank you thank you, thank you.